and welcome everyone to how e-commerce businesses can safely navigate through 2023. This is going to be a fascinating hour ahead with loads of great advice for all of you. And I'm really looking forward to being the person who is here to ask the questions and make sure you get the insight you need. So my name's Chloe Thomas. I'm the host of a couple of e-commerce podcasts and a author of a few e-commerce books as well. I've been in marketing for over 20 years now and I've done nearly 20 years in e-commerce. So I am very much here to make sure you get the goods out of our brilliant panelists and out of everything else that happens in this session. So what are we talking about today? Well, 2023 is going to be a challenging year. We've got the excess stock issues that we're all dealing with. We've got inflation pushing up your costs and reducing consumer spending. We've got supply chain issues. Yeah, they're still persisting and annoying us all. And we've got customer acquisition costs that just keep on rising. Now, I suspect none of this is news to any of you because you're working and dealing with this day to day. And the good thing is, though, that you're in the right place because today our panellists are going to be providing a whole range of ways in which you can not only safely navigate through this year and deal with all of those issues, but you can also thrive. So what are we going to be talking about today? What are we going to be covering today? Well, I'm going to start us off by taking us through some brand new exclusive stats. Um, to really set the scene and make sure we're all on the same page. Then we're going to meet with our expert panellists and explore the topic in much more detail and definitely switch from the problem to the solution side of things. And then we are going to go into a Q&A. So it's a Q&A. Now I've got a whole load of lovely questions prepped to ask our panellists, but I would love to also ask your questions. So if you've got any questions that you know of right now, that come up as we talk through various things, make sure you're adding them into the Q&A tab that you will see on the side of the screen. Add them there, they will get filtered through to me and I will do my best to get them asked, answered even by the panellists. Now, one warning on that is the sooner you ask a question, the more likely I am going to be able to get the answer for you. Do not wait until the last five minutes because then we won't have time to get your questions answered. So ask your questions as they come up. You can start now, start putting them in now, or you can wait and just as they come up, add them in. So that's on the side of your screen in the Q&A tab. Also in that little kind of admin console over there on the side of the screen, you'll see a chat feature. There you can interact with the speakers and your fellow attendees in real time. And if you've got any issues, put them in there and our team, behind the scenes team will deal with those for you as well. And then probably the most exciting tab on the side there is the docs tab. Now in there, Right now are three brilliant reports that you can download, packed with stats, some of which I'm going to be mentioning in a moment, all brand new data for 2023. We've got Inventory Planner's latest post-peak season excess stock guide. So if you're if you're struggling with the excess stock, you want that one right now. We've got Bright Pearl's newest e-commerce marketing and investment trends for 2023. Now I had a sneak preview of that one. So if you're working on your marketing plans, you need that one right now. And then we've got Conjura's e-commerce benchmark report for this year as well. And it's a bit of a spoiler alert coming up. On the next slide, you'll see a massive stat about how you all want benchmarking data at the moment. So I suspect you're all going to want to download that. Now, you can download all three of those docs at any point during this uh, session. So feel free to go and download those now or at any point as we go through. They are there for you to get your hands on and to help you take the learnings we're going to be sharing today even further in your business. OK, you can see the stats now. So I guess it must be time for me to run us through kind of what's going on and put some some numbers behind it all and give us some data to put us all on that same page as we go into our discussion today. Now, for me, the problems of the moment come down into three key areas. First off, we are drowning in stock. Nearly 50% of all retail brands are suffering with surplus stock at the moment. So that means the majority of you on this call have got stock you don't want to have, stock you want to shift. And even more surprisingly, for the average merchant, one fifth of their stock holding is unnecessary. So even if you think you're doing all right, the chances are quite a bit of that stock that's sitting on the warehouse, you don't need sitting in the warehouse. And it's why is this a problem? 
it's not just a problem because it's filling your warehouse up. It's also a problem or primarily a problem because excess stock is essentially big piles of cash sitting in your warehouse that aren't available for you to use for your marketing or to buy the right stock or to pay any of your other bills. It's just kind of sat there hidden from your business in some ways. And the longer it sits there, the harder it is to sell it at full price, which means you're going to make less margin when you sell it, which means not only is this affecting your cash flow, it's also impacting your profits as well. So number one, we're drowning in stock. Number two, the cost of recruiting new customers is only going up, which annoyingly makes it even harder to shift that excess stock. The new Bright Pearl research shows that the cost of new customer acquisition has increased three times. It, if you feel like it's going massively up, it is going massively up. Why are these costs increasing? Well, um, quite frankly, I could, do, I could do about three hours on this, but we'll drill it down to the quick points. There's more competition across all our marketing channels, which makes it harder to get in front of your customers and your target customers. The privacy law forced changes to the advertising platforms are continuing to create challenging situations, making it harder to make those platforms work as well as the prices going up. And that's happening on both Google and on Facebook ads. And consumers are less ready to spend. With all those economic issues we're facing, they're, they're thinking a lot more about whether or not they should make those purchases, which means the conversion rates are going down. It means they're seeing more of our marketing before they're making that decision to buy. The impact of all of this is that it's becoming more expensive, which means brands are, generally speaking, wanting to increase those marketing budgets. But you can't increase your marketing budgets if your cash is sat in the warehouse in stock you can't shift. So it all kind of comes in together. So number one, we're drowning in stock. Number two, the cost of recruiting new customers is only going up. Number three kind of ties all this together, which is the lack of visibility of our data. When we're being squeezed from all directions in our businesses, our decision making has to be absolutely on point and timely, i.e. quick. You can't wait till next week. You need to make the decision now. And that needs to happen at all levels of the business, from your junior team through to your senior team and across all your departments as well. So in order to do this, we've got to have the right data at our fingertips. And that is something which a lot of businesses aren't set up to have at the moment. And then, just, just to compound it all, when things are as changeable as they are at the moment, then insights into what's really happening in the industry become essential. Is it just us or is everyone else dealing with the, these same, same issues and seeing the same issues coming through? So that benchmarking data becomes absolutely essential. Hence why 83% of retailers in this recent survey are now saying they need access to a benchmarking tool. They want that data both about their business at their fingertips and about the wider industry. So these are our three big issues you need to safely navigate through in order to thrive in 2023. Stop drowning in stock, find the budget and the marketing methods to recruit new customers successfully and get your data visible across the business and as close to real time as you can. So now we're up to speed, thoroughly up to speed on the problems. I think it's time we started to share some solutions, which means it's time we get to meet our panelists. So I'm about to be joined. Uh, in fact, guys, you can come on stage now if you like. I'm about to be joined by three brilliant experts in this space. We've got Sarah Arthrell from Bright Pearl. We've got Jill from Inventory Planner and we've got Fran joining us from Conjura. Hello guys, how are you? Great, great. Good, how are you? Thank you. Excellent to, to have you all here. Um, could you all please, or each of you, give our audience a little intro about you? Because I gave like the, the shortest possible intro of each of you. So um, uh, Sarah, let's start with you. Yeah. I've... Oh, we've lost Sarah a second, so we'll switch to Jill. Jill, could you give us a little intro and then um... we'll come back to Sarah later? Oh, Sarah's back. We can. Oh, oh. can you? <laughs> Sarah, you disappeared oh. a second there. Sorry about this, everyone. Oh. Gremlins it's in the probably... system. 
internet Sarah. problems. Yes. Sarah, would you like to <laughs> give us a little intro, please? Yes. Hello again, everybody. Um, Sarah, CMO at Bright Pearl. I also work um, very closely with Jill at Inventory Planner. Been at Bright Pearl for about five years now total. Um, and I think everybody here can agree it's been a pretty exciting five years in the world of, of e-commerce, particularly the last couple, which I think is what makes this topic so timely today. So super excited to, to chat with some really great experts um, that are on the call and also here from folks that are sort of in the trenches as we speak. Um, so thanks everybody, excited for today. Excellent, and Jill. Yes, uh, so I'm Director of Product Marketing for Inventory Planner. Um, I've been on the Inventory Planner team for coming up on five years. And before that I was an Inventory Planner user um, and a merchant. So um, some of the things I'll, I'll mention today are uh, genuine war wounds of uh, experiencing it myself, but also having the opportunity to talk with tons of merchants over the last several years um, as well. Excellent. And um, Fran, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks, Chloe. So I am the CEO of Conjura, which is uh, an e-commerce analytics business. And I have been really working with data with operators, e-com investors and debt providers for the last six years. So hopefully we get all the angles covered from each side. Yeah, I think we have got all the angles covered in this. Um, it's excellent to be doing this with you guys. And as I said, I think I've dwelt on the problems for enough for all of us in the intro to this session. So let's flip it to the good stuff. Let's flip it to the advice you can share with our audience. Um, what's one learning that you've taken from everything you've seen up to yesterday, uh, you know, across the last, across 2022 and into up as far as yesterday, that you think all retailers need to be embracing in 2023 to navigate their way through these challenges. Um, and Fran, let's, uh, let's come to you first. Sure. Thanks, Chloe. So I guess, yeah, the rise in costs last year has put a huge squeeze on margins, as everybody knows. And, um, and for us, you know, operational efficiency has become so important. So you know, operators that looking at everything from warehousing, fulfillment, merchandising, managing customer support, you know, all of those components really need to be looked at closely. Excellent. Um, Jill? Yeah, I think more, more than ever, cash flow is king. I, I mean, it, running a business has always been about managing cash flow, but really seeing that crunch in the last half of 2022 and, and definitely the start of this year as well. So with customer demand being so volatile, really needing to have accurate up-to-date data to say what's happening right now. And then just being laser focused on prioritizing for what's working and what's not. So whether that's some catalog maintenance you know, clear out the stuff that's not working and, and get on it because it costs you money uh, with that inventory sitting in the warehouse. Um, and then really doubling down on what is working, which which locations, which channels, sizes, colors, product lines, all of that. So, so just staying on top of the latest data because things are changing so quickly. I, I love that cash flow point because I think it's um, an e-commerce business in some ways is very lucky that they've got some cash sitting there in the warehouse that they can release when they need to. I mean, we were talking about how it's annoying having your money tied up inventory, but it's a it's a lot quicker way to get to generate cash than it can be for a lot of other businesses. So I love that you've brought that one in. Um, Sarah, what's your your key thing to take from 2022? Yeah, I think it definitely sort of overlaps with what Fran and Jill have said. Um, from my perspective and more of like sort of the CMO hat, I think now more than ever, probably just the concept of budget planning being incredibly strategic. Um, I think, you know, in the past, at least from my perspective, there's been a little bit more of like a forgiving undertone to marketing spend sometimes. Um, don't tell my finance person I said that. Um, but I think, you know, certainly this this time, it's, it's just no longer the case. I have them, my finance team, my sales team asking me every day, you know, what am I doing to drive cost per lead and CAC down. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's that caveat while still being expected to bring in more leads than I did last year. And also, by the way, with less budget. Um, and so I think in order to really answer those questions from my finance team who are, you know, saying, why do you need more money or how are you going to be spending it? And also just ensuring that it's going as far as possible. You just really have to understand the data. Um, and I think, 
it's really challenged me to, to put on that data hat more than ever before and be able to sort of justify what it is that I'm doing, the decisions that I'm making, the sort of um, permission that I'm asking for <laughs> in some instances as well. So yeah, I'm all, I'm all about the data in addition to what Fran and Jill have shared as well. Yeah, it's like that year where everyone's heard the phrase, half your marketing budget is wasted. So we're just going to take away half your budget. It's like, oh, my God. Right. Now I like, need. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but we don't know which half is being wasted. Not allowed anymore. Exactly. It's like nightmare. Exactly. Um, well, look, we're going to come back to the data shortly, but let's let's kind of stick with the stock piece a bit, because I mentioned in the intro that the supply chain challenges are persisting quite annoyingly. They, they've almost become day to day. And we've got a couple of people on this call who are very, very good at, under, at understanding these things. So it'd be remiss of us not to talk to uh, to Jill and Fran about this. So um, Jill, Fran, we're tr we've said we're, we've got to try and make smarter decisions about our inventory, but the supply chain issues are kind of stopping us from doing that, which is obviously one of the reasons we've ended up within the excess stock situation. So how are you advising brands at the moment to deal with that? Jill, you are nodding furiously. So I'm going to come <laughs> to you first on this one. Yeah. So we've, we've seen an, I think an understandable overreaction to, you know, shortages and, and supply chain problems. So we saw early pandemic, um, you know, I, I would talk to merchants who say I have a year lead time and I need a year's worth of stock. I mean, Think about what was happening two years ago. You can't <laughs> tell me, you know, that anybody knew this is where we're going to be. Um, so it, it's an understandable reaction to what was happening. I think, again, kind of digging down in the data, it's not that we need to have a buffer or, or additional stock of everything, but honing in on what's really driving our profit, where are we going to get return on our inventory investment as quickly as possible, and building in some buffer just for those, you know, and, and being okay with some occasional out of stocks for things that are not driving revenue. You know, if you think about your 80, 20 rule, a lot of our stock is not driving our revenue. And so being okay with some occasional stock outs there, rather than saying, we always have to have everything in stock and just being smart about, you know, if we run out of these top performers in particular, that's when we're in trouble. So that's where we're going to focus our, our money, um, and our attention. It's kind of like using the data to override our emotions. Because yes. I've, I've come across brands who have no supply problems at all, but you've started hoarding stock because everyone yes. else is hoarding stock. And yes. it's like, if you've got the data, then you can see your way through that. Um, mm -hmm. So great advice there, Jill. And um, Fran, how about you? How would you suggest people yeah. deal with this? So yeah, no, on a very similar kind of data theme, I guess, um, so we've seen, you know, the really good operators now lean into understanding contribution margins so that you really understand the profit per product. They're starting to get a bit more holistic. So they're understanding products that, you know, drive higher repeat purchase rates. So they may strategically want, you know, they could discount a product if they know it'll drive more purchases down the line. And, you know, even things like just, um, I suppose if you're running out of stock and you still have paid ads on particular products, you know, you, you should just switch them off and let your organic traffic just handle the rest of the, the rest of the stock as it dwindles down. So just a lot of efficiencies, you know, if you dive deeper into the data, you can, you can get some really good wins. Yeah. It, it's that whole joining it up across all the silos, isn't it? To, to be smarter across the, sorry, to be smarter across the whole business, not just, the warehouse worries about this, the buying team worry about this. We've had a, a very interesting question coming from the audience, which is slightly linked to the answer you've just given us there, Fran. So I'm going to bring it in. Um, thank you, Nicholas, from Datamoff, asking this one. Now, Nicholas is asking, what percentage of overall sales do you put into the marketing budget? He's come from a lot of years in the automotive where that number was pretty fixed year on year and stable, but he's learnt that in e-commerce, I mean, this is one of those questions, it depends, is definitely going to be the answer on this one. Um, it is that it varies a lot more in the e-com world. So how, Nicholas is asking what what percentages you see most often. I'm going to kind of allow you to give him some advice on working out what his percentage should be. Um, Fran, you're, I think you're yep. nodding the most. So we'll come to you first on this one. Yeah, so like I'd say as a just a, a general standard, 15% cost of sales in, in marketing across, you know, a blended traffic. And then it's probably about 25% cost of sales across paid. 
And I will caveat that with, you know, if you have high repeat purchase rate, high lifetime value, and you have an acceptable payback period, you know, maybe you, you want to spend a little bit more than others because you know you'll be too good down the line. So, it, you know, some of it depends on your, your cash flow situation, but is that a rule of thumb? Probably 15% uh, yeah, total sales on marketing. Yeah, I agree with Fran. I think the other piece too is um, what we've done is sometimes you get that total budget number that's then distributed throughout the year, but we know we want to make some big bets at certain times of the year. So we'll move our budget up to sort of allocate what those big bets look like in like the first quarter or second quarter, knowing that if they work great, that I'm going to be asking for more money. And if they don't, then we've got sort of, um, you know, a fallback plan in the event that we need to decrease spend. But I think paying attention to your industry and, you know, what products move at certain times of the year, obviously the holiday season and peak season and things like that, strategically planning your budget on not just like an equitable distribution throughout the year, but when you want to move things forward or push things back. Yeah. It's like, like last year and the year before we've seen quite a lot of brands um, move a lot of their advertising budget to September or August to recruit customers then that they can sell to again via cheaper channels for Black Friday, exactly. rather than joining in the utter bun fight that is trying <laughs> to get advertising space on Black Friday. So yeah, that that phase, that when you spend it is so crucial as well. Jill, did you want to add anything to this one or should I go on to the next question? I, I think that Fran and Sarah nailed it. So <laughs> cool. pass it along to the next question. Yeah, Brilliant. Nicholas, thank you very much for that question. I hope that's helped. Anyone else? get those questions in and we will do our best to get them answered for you. So uh, we were talking about um, about the supply chain issues and how that feeds into everything. The thing we haven't talked about yet, which we really should for everyone, is some tips on how to clear that excess stock and turn it back into cash without giving away all our profit. Um, you're all working with retailers trying to do this right now. So what, what advice um, have you got for people? And Jill, um, I'll come to you first for this one. Yeah, definitely. So um, obviously there's there's discounting, but we're trying to think about other ways um, to move some stock out. So think about bundling items, either selling more, quantity more of the same item or bundling it with something else. One thing to keep in mind, and I think that we're going to see some long-term effects of massive discounts that we see on big brands right now is that it's cutting into their profit margins right now, but it's also doing their brand damage. Um, you know, Lululemon is an example where they're they're doing a lot of discounting. They normally don't do that, um, and so it sort of trains customers or shoppers to expect lower prices, to be more cost conscious, to wait for a sale, uh, and wait for those discounts. So another approach can be how do we kind of upsell. Um, you know, maybe we're putting in a free product or we bundle these together and it's, yes, it's a lower margin, but it, there's just a, a psychology of we're upselling, we're not discounting, there's more value. So you're preserving some of the brand value there. So that can, that can be one approach. Um, you know, just <clears throat> kind of to underline this, the, the value of bundling, if we think about almost all retailers have some sort of free shipping threshold. So it really the cost that we're incurring in shipping, there's sort of a, a, a fee, you know, to send any box out the door, but then to put two more items, three more items in that same box, it doesn't double, triple your cost of shipping. It's, it's a nominal amount more. So the more we can get into one box, we're eating that free shipping, you know, cost, but we're, we're getting more out there and we have larger basket sizes as well. I, I love that advice because I think so often people just go, oh, we'll just take 20% off, 30% off, whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you get back to what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to get more more units gone. So you do yeah. a bundle, you do a three for two offer, you you raise that that order value for the free PMP and you're mm -hmm. encouraging your customers to buy more units and help you solve the problem. It's mm -hmm. it's kind mm -hmm. of matching, matching the promotion to the solution. Um, it also, and, um, I think, sorry, just to add in, Jill, I think, it also helps with that concept of getting like a repeat 
buyer. So you're sort of satisfying them in that first sale, which almost always a merchant will lose money because of CAC, right? Mm -hmm. Like we just know it's so expensive to get that customer in the door. So you need to create an experience that gets them coming back a second, third, fourth, infinite amount of times mm -hmm. and giving them some sort of like bundle opportunity. Psychologically, I really liked how you talked about that. It sort of plays into that same mindset too. They're more likely to come back and buy from you again, because they've mm -hmm. had that positive experience with then, you know, customer lifetime value, all those sort of acronym alphabet soup that we know, um, but it does all sort of tie back to each other as well. Hmm. And Fran, you, you come at this from a slightly different perspective rather than the discounting another approach. Yeah. So I think again, combining different metrics. So, you know, if you've got a good conversion rate of a product, but something like low product views, you know, you, you need to promote obviously change the merchandising strategy of your website. Um, and, you know, I know marketing isn't the solution for everything, but we see a lot of, again, almost the, the better performing operators have more marketing spend that can be attributed to specific products. So you can, you can actually hook your catalog into Meta, for example, and have, you know, more of your ad clicks going straight to a product. So you can kind of get product return on ad spend. Um, so really, you know, I, I'd say focusing, if you are on marketing, focusing on getting those marketing clicks going directly onto your product page rather than your homepage. Um, so yeah, data again, lots of good use cases. Well, yeah, no, there is nothing more depressing as a consumer than getting onto a product listing page and everything you look at is out of stock. And there's nothing worse as a someone working at an e-commerce brand when you know you've got overstocks when half the product on that first page is out of stock. So even the on-site merchandising can be your friend. You know, make sure the product on the homepage is in stock. It's uh, and, and then what you're putting in your emails, even if you're not discounting, get those right items in there. Excellent advice, team. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so we're. <laughs> We're turning some of that overstock back into cash, which means we've got some cash to go and buy some more products. What we want to avoid is creating the same problem again. So how do we buy smarter? How do we pl plan our inventory smarter to, to replenish in a way that's not going to cause us more problems um, down the line? Who'd like to give us a starter on this one? Uh, I can jump in on this one. So um, a couple of points. One is thinking about, you know, we have a budget for purchasing inventory. How quickly are we going to get a return on investment? And then how large is that return going to be, you know, and, and finding the sweet spot in between those. Um, and I think also keeping in mind, just it all comes back to cash flow, right? It's always about cash flow. And so, um, there may be a trade-off for a slightly lower margin, but we're getting the cash back in the door, you know, through customer purchases more quickly. And that is worth something. So it doesn't pay the bills. Uh, it doesn't pay salaries to have inventory sitting in the warehouse that's worth whatever it's worth. I can't use that to pay the rent. I can't use that to pay salaries. So just thinking about how do we turn that into cash as quickly as possible and keep the cash flow healthy We've definitely seen a lot of big name retailers run into a lot of trouble where they may be profitable, but the cash flow situation is really, you know, kind of kicking them while they're down. So, so keeping that in mind, one merchant that we worked with took a look at this and said, okay, what's the value of our inventory that's sitting in the warehouse? We need to lower that. Basically, we need more cash on hand. And so they took an approach of placing more purchase orders that are smaller more frequently, rather than maybe buying for a month at a time, they're buying for three weeks at a time. Um, and so what that does is it helps out their cash flow situation. They were able to drop the value of their inventory by a million and a half dollars within six weeks. Like that's basically found money, right? Like we've got a million and a half dollars that we didn't have six weeks ago. Um, but also, you know, when we think about forecasting demand, if we're looking at shorter periods of time, we can have greater confidence in that. So. One, we've got the cash, but we're also less likely to get into that situation. You know, if we're forecasting a year out, there's just so many variables that you can't have a lot, a really high degree of confidence in that. Excellent. Yeah. And this is definitely one of those areas you're looking at it daily or weekly. 
mm-hmm. and the, mm-hmm. the ballpark's changing every time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fran, any tips in this area? Yeah, so I mean, I think cash is king as, as Jill covered, but there are other, you know, s- some customers, for example, might have issues with attracting new customers, you know, and, and we know operators are struggling to get more and more new customers. Uh, we had a customer recently who, a fashion business who, who were sort of de- debating whether to reorder a particular dress and, and they figured that, it, or like they found out through the data that it drove a lot of new customers over, over other products. So, you know, if their goal is to get more new customers, then they need to kind of, you know, make decisions with, with products and what products drive new customers in mind. So yeah, it depends on the product or the problem within the business, but again, looking, you know, across a few different metrics for products can be really interesting. It is, it always, I mean, I'm a marketer to the core, but it always amazes me how much we spend time talking about finding the marketing method that bring, drives new customer acquisition and finding the ad set and the creative that drives new customer acquisition. And no one seems to talk about the product that drives new customer acquisition. It's it's such an obvious thing to do. Like, oh, everyone likes buys this product. You know, 80% of our new customers buy this product. Like, right. Well, that should always be in stock. It's I think that that's kind of possibly one of the good things that's going to come out of the challenges of 2023 is that brands are joining the dots on this and seeing that more complete picture and putting in place the the uh, the tools and the data sets that are going to give them that data. Um, so, yeah, lo- loving that you're bringing up the product side of it. So. Drill kind of linking into this, I suppose. Are there any other tips you've got around using this data to improve those marketing and advertising campaigns? We touched on it a little bit with feeding data through to Facebook um, and you know thinking about which products we're doing. But um, Sarah, you're you're deep in the marketing. What what's your take on taking all this great inventory data and using it to improve our marketing decisions? Yeah, it's such a good segue to I think what even Fran was just talking about. Um, and I think when I when I talk to customers about data, um, especially the ones who've like really mastered it, they see their their marketing and inventory or product data, not as like these two separate things, but really codependent sets of data that rely on each other. Like you can't have one without the other. So Chloe, you had used that example, like, you know, advertising something on your homepage that you're actually out of stock of is like the worst case scenario, right? And so, without really like uh, an understanding of what that inventory performance looks like by product and what those customer behaviors really look like across all your different marketing channels, there's going to be sort of this like disconnect. And I think a lot of times, particularly in the past, and we've alluded to this as well, you're sort of making those advertising decisions off of like a best guess or maybe an instinct, or I hear this a lot, like what worked for us last year, or two years ago, but we also know that this year looks a lot different than it did last year and, and the year before that. So you can't really afford not to be like super dire, but also to be a bit dire, like your business can't afford to rely on that instinct. So bridging those worlds together and really viewing them as one. And that includes not just the data, but those two teams as well, like within your business, bringing them together, make sure they're on the same page, I think is what sort of separates the the good from the great in terms of, you know, planning for what the rest of the year looks like in into the future. I love that you added that team thing. If I think back 20 odd years to when I actually sat in a retailer's head office as part yes. of the marketing team and would would constantly be talking to the buying and merchandising teams what promo are we doing what product do you want featured in this email what what's going on the cover of the catalog and knowing full well how annoyed they would be with me yep. if i put the wrong <laughs> products out there it's it's such it should be one of the strongest relationships in the business between your buying and merchandising teams and your marketing teams to make sure the right decisions are made, being made in the right places um fran anything you you want to dive further into that marketing piece you started us off on i guess one of the metrics that kind of jumps out when you marry all that together is is the concept of a product lifetime value which is really you know turning the customer lifetime value on its head so you know we've interesting even in businesses like you know homeware businesses where there could be big ticket items but you know a big couch could drive a lamp or you know four or five other sales on the back of it and that concept of product lifetime value is something that 
we see more and more customers using. So looking at it from a product lens and then a customer lens as well. Yeah, it's that, it's that again, we come back to having this kind of like non-siloed team view of what's happening. Um, so we've talked about the increase in acquisition costs that we're seeing, which I think we kind of have to bring into this marketing discussion as well, because it is, it's quite scary, I think, for brands <laughs> at the moment who, who have been over the last couple of years just chucking all the money at Facebook ads to massively oversimplify the situation. So any any advice for brands who are looking to, to survive through these acquisition costs at the moment? And Sarah, I'll come as, as our kind of resident marketer, I'll come to you first again on this one. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a question I spend a lot of time talking about. <laughs> um, it's not just in webinars like this, but with my team. It does. It seems like sort of the perfect storm right now, right? Like brands are are going to likely have their marketing budgets cut in a time when we know CAC and digital advertising costs are skyrocketing. And I think eating up already pretty stretched marketing budgets. We all know it's usually one of the first things to get cut, um, you know, when times are tough. And so in the past, I think there was like this strategy that was along the lines of like, you got to spend more to make more. And that might have worked a, a few years ago, but that's just become unsustainable, right? As the space has gotten so competitive with increasing operating costs and even a potential decline maybe in consumer spending, or as Jill mentioned, you know, tons and tons of pressure on cash flow. And I think our insights that Chloe, you talked about earlier, they suggest that marketing investment will likely be again, focused on your paid digital channels. But I encourage brands to think a little bit outside the box with that, because we've actually got caught in that before too at, at Bright Pearl and Inventory Planner sort of blindly allocating more spend to meta and, and PPC because that's what we've always done, right? But we we didn't really understand the performance across each of those channels and like truly dive into what's working and what's not. And then it almost would be like too late by the time we realized it wasn't working. We had already wasted so much money. Um, that's really hard to get back. So we sort of came back to the drawing board and, and really went into our data to understand. We knew we needed to diversify our spend, but we didn't know where or how, and the data helped us answer those questions. So testing and analyze, you know, for us, it was investing more into email marketing and, and opening up some syndicated marketing channels and really developing like a true account-based marketing strategy. It could look very different for brand to brand. Um, but I think it's, it's always good that, you are relying more on that instinct um, or what your gut is telling you and not assuming that what has worked before will, will work again. So maybe you're testing new channels. Obviously, you know, TikTok is blowing up. There's text message marketing. Jill, you talked about bundles earlier. I think there's some new technology as well that's sort of um, recommending, you know, at the bottom of your product page, you're buying the shirt. Hey, how about this dress or these shoes or these, this necklace, like sort of, creating a very personalized experience for, for the consumer, all those types of things. But again, tying it back to what the hell's actually working. <laughs> and that's where we want to really spend our time. Yeah, it's so about that diversification of channels this year. And I'm going to add one in. And then we've had a couple of brilliant questions come in. So we're going to jump over to those. But I couldn't not say, <laughs> invest some time on getting your messaging right. You know, we've, we've, we've kind of talked about it in the abstract here about putting the right products in front of the customers about bundling rather than discounting but getting down to the brass tacks of why does the customer buy from you and then mirroring that in your marketing on your website it's an awful lot cheaper than a week's worth of Facebook ads um, and it will improve your responses everywhere so that's my little plug um, <laughs> plug of an idea but like I said we've had a couple of Brilliant questions come in around forecasting, which is obviously such a crucial thing for keeping the cash in the business, for profitability and so forth. So we're going to come to Doug's question first. Um, any tips for forecasting for extended lead times? Yeah, because you can you can try and do it. But if it's coming on a boat from China, you, there's only so much you can do. Um, some of our international vendors have total lead time of 270 days. Um, trends, economy, needs change so much in that time. So um, I guess, I think this is a question that could be a whole webinar on its own. Um, Jill, I'll come, I think you're the obvious person to come to first for the answer yeah. on this one. So the floor is yours. Yeah, first of all, Doug, uh, 
you have my sympathy on a 270 day lead time, but I get that's the reality of things too. Um, I, you know, this is where um, one, having a good relationship or building a good relationship with your vendor might be able to make some headway on this. Um, so what we've seen some folks do is provide forecasting, kind of longer range forecasting to their vendors. So it might be six, 12 months out, you know, so maybe 12 months in your case, 12 months out. These are estimates. We're not placing purchase orders, but here's what it looks like, <clears throat> you know, kind of thinking of talking to them, why the 270 day lead time, do they need to get components on hand? They have to do their ordering. So just providing those estimates sometimes can lead to discounting or just a better relationship. And then you put in specific POs that might be able to cut down on that a little bit. Um, so that's, that's an approach that we've seen quite a few merchants take. Um, two, you know, I've been stuck with um, a primary vendor on a really important category that I was selling and um, that relationship kind of fell apart. And so I really learned the lesson of like needing to have a backup plan and probably a backup plan to the backup plan for our most important categories and products. Um, so I know that that's a big undertaking, but just thinking about, you know, all sorts of things can happen, um, especially when we're talking about overseas vendors. Um, you know, what's what's our backup plan? Maybe somebody in a different country um, as well. Um, so those are those are some things I would suggest um, in terms of kind of vendor relationships there. Jill, is it ever worth phasing out a vendor when the lead time's that long? If it's not one of your top 10% of products, if it's not a new customer acquisition product, is it worth taking a little bit of a hard decision and go, actually, mm -hmm our lives would be better if we weren't dealing with this um, supplier. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's part of that catalog maintenance, which I think is, is not kind of the most sexy or fun thing to do. Like it's really fun to launch new products, right. Or, or like go shopping for new products or design new products. Like that's the fun stuff. Um, but discontinuing things and saying, Oh, that, that really didn't deliver like we thought it would, or it's been around forever and it just doesn't have any juice left in it. Um, is really important, you know, both for just kind of the noise on your own website, um, within your warehouse as well, um, your cash, there's there's a lot of considerations and just sort of the um, time that goes into the vendor relationship as well. You know, there's time of ordering, communicating with them, the cost of shipping those things over, like it's sucking up all sorts of resources. So yeah, sometimes it's it's worth cutting off those relationships too. And Fran, you're in this arena as well. Anything you want to add in yeah. on this? Yeah. So like, I, I guess I'm, we're obviously very less operational, but I think, you know, last year, as with a lot of businesses would have been forecasting probably, you know, 10% year on year growth type type figure. And from, you know, and we, we saw from our benchmarking tool, as soon as, you know, even as early as January last year, things were turning. So if you were monitoring you know, January, February were down year on year last year. It was a bit of an indicator. And, and actually there was a similar enough trend all across the year. So I guess if you were, you know, ordering nine months out from Black Friday, you would have had a bit of an indicator there if, if you were actually looking at the markets in terms of benchmarking. So there are definitely signals, I think, that you can get, um, you know, broader macro signals uh, if you use benchmarking. Nice. Okay. Then the other forecasting question we've have had, definitely a trend today, um, <laughs> is from Harleen. So Harleen, thank you for this one. Um, he is asking, actually kind of the exact opposite of Doug's question, for a new line where you've not got a similar product in the range, just to make it that little bit harder, how on earth do you work out how much to buy? How do you manage the onboarding of a new product? Mm -hmm. um, Jill, I'll come to you first on this one again. Yeah, I, I think there's I mean, short of having a crystal ball. So so we're kind of chipping away at the unknown here. Like how, how can we get some data that supports what is most likely to happen until we can get some sales going and get a little bit of data. So chipping away at that. Um, you know, one, take a look at, I know you said there aren't similar products, but do you have similar option sets in other products? And what I mean by that is similar sizing, similar colors, like anything in common with anything you have already. Um, you know, what's the distribution of that, you know, black sells better than green sells better than pink, that sort of thing. So just any sort of similar data on any attribute, that'll kind of help you go in the right direction. Um, 
to look at launches overall within your store. Some stores we see massive spikes on release day and then it dies off after a couple of days. And so for forecasting, they actually want to kind of ignore that initial launch and look at normal life after that. For some folks, it's really a ramp up, you know, kind of slow and steady and it builds over time. So look at how launches perform within your store. Um, and then if you're reselling products, talk to your vendor and learn how it sells when other people are selling it as well. You know, what data do they have? This is our most popular seller. This sells well at this time of year. They should have some insight into that. Um, so pick their brain. I mean, they want you to be successful too. So <laughs> work together again, building those relationships with your vendors um, can be helpful, especially when you're reselling products. Um, Fran, Sarah, anything you want to add in on predicting for a brand new product? Yes, I'll just I'll throw a curveball in there. There are actually some really clever competitor intelligence tools out there now mm -hmm. um, that they, and this is, this, I explain how they work. It's they use, they have kind of well-known conversion rates and they can track traffic at sort of keyword level so they can build a proxy for revenue for rival brands in different product categories and they've done it very well so i would say and they're also not not that expensive so using some of these better intelligence tools that are coming on now for retailers is is, is a really good thing to do so yeah, I was going to I was going to say the competitive route too, Fran, um, but I think the other piece just as sort of an ad additional consideration is um, working with your marketing teams to understand a lot of times they'll have insight into like real insight into um, some of the points that Jill had made, like how to sort of new drops perform. Is it that sharp increase? Is it a steady, you know, increase over time? Um, and then they can even create some suggestions as well to sort of strategically and creatively like tease the drop um, or tease the new product based off of how much inventory you know you will get or you know you will have um, and then sort of position it as like we only have a certain amount that's available. So it's creating some of the urgency around like get it now while it's hot, so to speak. And then, um, you know, using the out of stock almost as like uh, an asset in some ways to help drive some of that, that business. Yeah, another great example of marketing and merchandising yep. buying working together. You can solve each other's problems. That's my problem. theme. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we've had another audience question again on the subject of forecasting. This is where where the where the uh, the insight is today. Uh, Chris asks, "When forecasting, I have really short lead times." Congratulations, Chris. That does make your life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but. He doesn't always have the cash to fulfill the whole recommended replenishment. So how does he handle that? And his specific question is, what's the best parameter to base the forecast on when you don't have the cash to fulfill the whole piece? So when you've got limited cash, how do you work out where to place it? Jill, are we coming back to you? We're coming back to you again on this. Yeah, one. I'm like having flashbacks to like, this was my life as a merchant. It was just like, oh, I've got this much money and this much that I want to do. Well, how do I make it work? Um, you know, so I did a lot of um, just like working out my cash flow situation based on the forecast. When am I likely to get in? How much revenue? When are my bills due? You know, do I have net 14? Is it due on? you know, receipt, do I have net 30, uh, which seems like such a luxury, you know, just like how much time do I have to earn the money back before I have to pay the bill um, and trying to like um, thread the needle there. So I think this is really where you're going to have to make some hard choices of, okay, this is my best bet for what's going to return revenue as quickly as possible. You know, so here's where we might take some hits to the optimal margin in deference of getting some cash flow back, like still be profitable. I'm not saying take it that far, but you know, like there's a trade off there of what's our best bet to get this back as fast as possible. Um, and again, talk to your vendor, you know, sometimes, sometimes it, they're not movable um, on things, but just talking to them about, okay, this is a new launch. We're trying it out you know, could we get kind of a, a wave on the minimum order quantity for this first one? Here's our longer term plan, that kind of thing. And just like working with them um, to show how you're building demand. Um, Fran, Sarah, anything you want to add in an addition on that one? 
No, I think Jill covered it for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the vendor relations yeah. one. I learned that from Jill, actually. Um, so she's she's mentioned it a couple of times, but it is, I find if you just like pick up the phone and have that conversation, a lot of times there can be some movement because they're dealing with very similar things on their side mm -hmm. as well, sometimes in a much larger scale. So there can sometimes be some empathy, um, but you don't know unless you try. <laughs> it's kind of like times like these, all those conversations you've had with them over the years and the months start to pay back when you're going, yeah. I've got a bit of a squeeze. I love your product. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess this is that um, a bit of that uh, management of your, your vendor landscape as well. If you've got someone who's playing ball and you can source more products for them, then it becomes a win-win for everybody. And if you um, have we, data too, to like back up some of the claims to sort of tie it back to the topic here, like I think, I've talked about how I need to go to finance and ask for more money. Sometimes on, you know, a merchant side, it's a little bit different, but if you have like numbers and accurate sort of real, like quantitative measurements that can help you tell your story, that can be beneficial to those conversations as well. Yeah, definitely. A, a chat with your vendor that goes, look, this is where I'm at. These are the stats. This is what yeah. I know I can sell. And you're giving them the numbers is a lot better than going, Hi, I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because exactly. you're you're in a much better position to negotiate and organise it with them. Right, we got one time for one last question from the audience. Which I, this is one of those ones where I think it's a quick answer, but it, oh, who knows? Um, so, Tierno, and apologies if I pronounced that wrong, uh, but thank you for your question. I was wondering if you have special tips for low margin products, ten to twenty percent margin. So, we've talked about the maximum lead time. Let's talk about the teeny tiny margins. Any tips on handling that? This is super rough. <laughs> Just <laughs> to be straight, this is rough. Um, the first thing I would actually do is go back and make sure that's what your margin is, and you're not actually losing money when you factor in your free th shipping threshold, all of your customer acquisition, everything on marketing. Like, like, are you actually making money on this? I would go back and crunch numbers again and again and again. This is a tough business model to do. Um, if you're confident in it, then large basket size is going to be your key here of just like squeezing everything you can out of each box that leaves your warehouse. Um, so you're trying to sell 10 units at a time rather than one. Um, it's all about quantity there. Um, it's it's a really hard business model to make work well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, normally when I see that kind of margin, it's it tends to be resellers who don't have huge stock risk. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's very tough to manage. If you're taking on your own stock in that kind of margin, you're in, it's very tight. Um, and like we, I suppose we've seen almost 50% margin businesses become 40% margin businesses overnight with, with the squeeze on costs, you know, it's, so it's, that's yeah, a tricky world. It's... Sorry, Tiano, not much more than that on that one, I'm afraid, but we're going to end on a slightly more positive note with my last question to all of you, <laughs> which is we're here to try and help everyone navigate through the challenges of 2023. So you, and you've all been working in this industry for a decade or more, sorry to age you all, but you have, um, dealing with these challenges. So is there one last piece of advice you'd like to give our audience in terms of ways you've seen retailers successfully adapt to times like these? Um, Sarah, let's, let's come to you first and we'll work our way around. Yeah, you sort of um, answered it a bit in that question, Chloe. I think it's a lot of it is like that adapt and overcome adage, right? Like with that adaptation requires a lot of flexibility and knowing what things to do differently, what dated systems to finally get rid of. Um, they've probably been a headache for a long time, but you feel the pain even more in times like this. And so really just like biting the bullet and making the decision to make the switch. Um, it will be like short-term pain, but for an infinite long-term gain. And so I really, I think leaning into the technology that you have or that is out there to, to plan that demand and increase your sales and profit and just move really quickly as those markets change. And I think just to stress Jill's point that she's just shared a few times, always, always, always keep an eye on your cash flow. Um, we've seen profitable businesses sink because they ran out of cash. Um, and the best way to really approach that is just, you know, managing your inventory investment, allocating that inventory and making sure it matches with how you're spending your, your marketing and advertising costs. And not just because it'll help you sort of navigate the tough times, but also 
we will get through this just like we always have. And I think when you get to the other side, be in a much better position to really, really catapult and take off because of all the work that you've done, you know, during this time. Excellent advice. Um, Fran, let's come to you next and then we'll end with Jill. Yeah. So I think one thing that stood out for me last year was, you know, different territories had different sort of uh, severities of, of setbacks. So the customers that I suppose diversified inter inter and internationalized actually were able to ride out the harder times much better. So, um, and I guess with, you know, with a lot of the technology being commoditized, you, you can experiment with spinning up a website, you know, in a new territory in, in their language at a, a low capital expenditure. So I'm a big fan of just, yeah, trialing new territories and just with limited investment and see how it goes. I love that bit of diversification of risk there. Yeah. Always a good, always, always never a bad idea, although it does take a bit more effort. Um, Jill, the last answer, please. Yeah, so just building on what Fran said, even um, of diversification, as you're diversifying and looking ahead, this is um, this is where it really pays off to dig into the data because each sales channel, each territory um, has its own sort of personality. You know, if you're managing several brick and mortars, they all sell different items at different rates. You're gonna see that. So when I was a merchant, you know, you could, you could take a look at our best performing categories online. And we opened up a brick and mortar store and just basically turned that category ranking upside down. It was just the opposite that happened in person. Um, one of the merchants that we work with in home fitness equipment, you can imagine they were going gangbusters early in the pandemic, looking to expand from Canada into the US. So they found quickly that different categories were selling differently, you know, in a different country. Um, and that saved them a lot of money because they're shipping weights. I mean, that's expensive stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and eventually they were able to grow twice as fast as they otherwise would have, they estimated, you know, because they had that data, they could get on top of it. They had the right inventory for the audience that matched that demand. So just digging into your data, it's not one size fits all, looking at the different kind of personalities and matching that up. Brilliant. Well, look, um, huge thank you to Jill, Fran and Sarah for all your tips and advice. We have covered a lot of ground today. For me, I think the big takeaways are you need to get as obsessed with your inventory data as you have been with your marketing metrics. Bringing those two together, bringing your teams together is going to give you the insight you need to protect that cash flow, to manage that cost of acquisition and not just to survive and navigate your way through this year, but just to thrive as well. Because let's face it, we want to end this year on a high despite all those difficulties we've got to deal with now if you want to uh to get a bit more insight and, and nail that benchmarking bit we were talking about earlier then bright pearl have a free self-service retail benchmarking tool you can get that at info.brightpearl.com forward slash benchmarking and there's a qr code if you fancy grabbing that one you will also in the very near future be getting the replay of this session so you can watch that with your team give it to them to watch as a bit of homework um great way to bring everyone up to speed on the things we've been talking about today and to make sure you get those those details and don't forget to download before we finish those docs where you'll get more on those um, stats we were talking about earlier and more tips too so huge thank you for the team at Bright Pearl for putting this together huge thank you to Fran, Sarah and Jill for being here and providing their genius to all of you and thank you to those of you who asked the questions and to the rest of you for tuning in and watching it's been an absolute pleasure to hang out with you for the last hour Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.